This is Latter-day Presentations, where we discuss topics and issues of faith for Latter-day Saints. Yes, Russell M. Nelson is an authentic prophet. Sometimes there's a tendency to think that members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints assume that the president of the church is serving as a real authentic prophet of God. But no, it turns out we have very specific, concrete reasons for our convictions that the president of the church is a prophet of God. In this presentation, I hope to share those, and I hope they'll be helpful to you. As a starting point, I want to reiterate something that I said in my presentation on Joseph Smith. In terms of epistemology, I value people's opinions, and I value well-researched narratives. But more than those, I value the testimony of credible witnesses. And way more than those, I value things I can observe with my own eyes in the present. This is a basic glimpse of where I'm coming from in terms of epistemology as I think through these issues. And let's talk through foundational assumptions as we begin asking these questions. Like, what is a prophet? Well, some typical answers that we hear in response to that question are someone who predicts the future or someone who sees beyond our time, someone who challenges the political establishment, someone who challenges the religious establishment, someone who prefaces his or her prophecies with thus saith the Lord, and someone who works mighty public miracles. Now, why do I list these things? I have seen each of these items put forward as criticisms of the president of the church, like somehow he's not a prophet if he doesn't do one of these things. But the problem with that criticism is not all of those things apply to every prophet in scripture. And so that actually begs a really important question. What is a prophet? And I'm going to give my simple definition. It's someone whom God has called to prophesy. It's someone who exercises prophetic gifts under authentic inspiration from God, or someone who participates in the institutional prophetic office. Let's talk about each of these three things. Someone whom God has called to prophesy. There are some very simple examples of this. Moses, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Joseph Smith, and others. Someone who exercises prophetic gifts under authentic inspiration from God. And here I'm going to offer the story of Anna the prophetess in the Gospel of Luke. We're told that she was a woman who fasted and prayed a lot and spent a lot of time in the temple. And in that context, she developed spiritual gifts to the extent that people came to regard her as an authentic prophetess. And her story is an amazing example of how prophetic gifts can be developed even among people who do not hold a formal prophetic institutional calling. Now let's talk about someone who participates in the institutional prophetic office. Well, what do I mean by that? In Matthew 23, we have this passage, Then spake Jesus to the multitude and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. All therefore whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do. Here Jesus was telling the people around him, to honor that institutional prophetic office that was held by the scribes and the Pharisees. Even though Jesus had some pretty serious disagreements with many of the scribes and Pharisees, he still wanted the people around him to honor that institutional prophetic office that they occupied in the Sanhedrin that he called Moses' seat. Now, how do prophets operate? Well, that depends on a combination of several factors. What does God need to accomplish? What are the prophet's personal gifts? What is the receptivity of the people? And when we talk about receptivity, we need to go to Isaiah 6. And this is part of the call narrative of when Isaiah was actually called to be a prophet. Here we have a really interesting communication from the Lord to Isaiah. And he said, Go and tell this people, Hear ye indeed, but understand not, and see ye indeed, but perceive not. Make the heart of this people fat, and make their ears heavy, and shut their eyes lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and convert and be healed. This is a discussion of the receptivity of the people to whom Isaiah was going to preach. They were not receptive to the message. And so what we seem to be hearing here is that Isaiah was told 
to structure and shape his prophetic message in accordance with people's receptivity. We see this echoed by the Savior in the Gospel of Mark. And here he's talking about why he teaches in parables. And he said unto them, Unto you it is given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God. But unto them that are without, all these things are done in parables, that seeing they may see and not perceive, and hearing they may hear and not understand, lest at any time they should be converted and their sins should be forgiven them. Again, this is reiterating what was spoken to Isaiah. This is a clear allusion to that passage in Isaiah. Prophets don't always communicate everything they have been told by God. And even when they do, they tailor their message and shape it according to the receptivity of their audience. In my project on the book of Isaiah, I showed this table where we have all these passages throughout the book of Isaiah, and I sort of color-coded them so that you can see how they correspond to each other. This concept of receptivity is very important in the ministry of Isaiah, and it conveys an interesting reality to us, that prophetic activity is almost like a negotiation with the people based on their willingness to give heed and really take seriously and understand what the prophet needs to communicate to them. Now let's talk about the prophetic mantle in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Well, we believe the prophetic mantle passed along from Joseph Smith through a succession that continues into the present day, and the prophetic office is filled by the most senior apostle. Now this is a system that's kind of interesting, because we understand that if the Lord wants a certain set of gifts and perspectives and understandings to come forward at a particular time in history, the Lord can use this system of succession to put the right person in place at the right time. And that's how we understand the Lord to be operating in this system of prophetic succession. Here we have a YouTube video by Stephen Jones that I recommend. And you can see in this video the evolution of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles and the First Presidency over time. You can see how, over time, the average age of members of these quorums has increased. And why is that a good thing? Why is it good for these quorum members to be old? <laughs> That's a question worth exploring. Well, people who are more advanced in age, they've seen a lot. They've been through a lot. They're not going to be rattled by a lot of things that younger people might be rattled by. They're not going to behave as impulsively as younger people. And that is extremely valuable. If you are running an organization that needs stability and consistency and continuity over time, you want seasoned leadership who are not going to fall apart in the face of difficult situations because they've seen things, they've been there they know how to respond. Again, if you have ever belonged to an organization that is led by someone who offers a stable influence in the highest echelons of leadership, it's a much better environment to work in as opposed to situations where you have lack of experience and lack of exposure to challenges. And so people's responses are more impulsive and erratic over time. So this is a very, very valuable trend among the governing quorums of the church. And let's talk about the alternative. What happens when religious communities don't have a steady and consistent system of succession? Well, you get power struggles, like we recently saw with McLean Bible Church here in Virginia. A very public, loud power struggle and a lot of controversy, hurt feelings, lawsuits, and so forth. And this is actually fairly common in many congregations. When you don't have this predictable system, you get a lot of turmoil and hurt feelings and friendships and families torn apart in these situations. So let's talk about the calling of President Russell M. Nelson. How was he called to the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles? It's worth reading from his biography. Here his biographer gives us a glimpse of what happened. 
On January 11, 1984, a year to the day after the passing of Elder Richards, Elder Mark E. Peterson of the Twelve passed away. Now there were two vacancies in the Twelve, and if anything, the situation was more critical. President Kimball's health had deteriorated even further, and his mind was less dependable. To make matters worse, those privy to the situation knew President Kimball was in no condition to receive the revelation to extend such calls. For months, President Gordon B. Hinckley, the only healthy member of the First Presidency at the time, President Marion G. Romney's health had also deteriorated, had left standing instructions with President Kimball's caregivers that if his mind ever cleared, they were to call him immediately, regardless of the hour. Month after month passed with no call. From time to time, President Hinckley looked in on President Kimball, but an opportunity to discuss such a spiritually sensitive topic as calls to the Twelve never presented itself. Then, at about 2.30 a.m., on the Wednesday morning prior to the April 1984 General Conference, the phone rang at President Hinckley's home. President Kimball was alert and would like to talk to him. President Hinckley rushed downtown to President Kimball's suite in the Hotel Utah, where the issue of vacancies in the Twelve was raised. President Kimball said simply, Call Nelson and Oaks to the Quorum of the Twelve, in that order. This is a remarkable story to consider, seeing how the call to an apostle was issued by the President of the Church during a time when the president of the church was not well, but did have a moment of lucidity where he was able to convey this inspired message. I would also add, some people might look at these kinds of situations where a president of the church falls ill for a time or is incapacitated for a time and might be troubled by that idea. And I would offer a couple of points to consider. Number one, The president of the church has counselors, and those counselors are capable of doing most of the work of the first presidency, except for a few functions like the calling of apostles that have to be done by the president of the church. And another one is more historical. When we look back on the ministry of Isaiah, for example, the book of Isaiah, as we have it now, contains 66 chapters of prophecy But we know that he prophesied for 30 or possibly 40 or more years. So what was he doing during the rest of that time when he wasn't writing those 66 chapters? We don't know, but it's clear he wasn't constantly issuing prophecies that were picked up and added to his book. So again, there's some scriptural historical precedent to consider here. And I'd reiterate, the counselors in the first presidency are capable of doing a lot of the work of that quorum. Now let's read an account from Elder Boyd K. Packer. He says, in 1930, J. Reuben Clark was named as U.S. ambassador to Mexico. Two and a half years later, he was called by letter as second counselor to President Heber J. Grant. General conference had come and gone, and a vacancy in the First Presidency was not filled. A senior apostle told me that two members of the Twelve waited upon President Grant and said, We see you did not fill the vacancy in the Presidency. President Grant replied, I know the man the Lord wants me to have, and he is not ready yet. Pointing his cane at each of them, he said, I know that feeling when it comes. I had it when I called you and I had it when I called you. When that cane pointed at me, one of them told me, I felt as if I had been electrocuted. So here's another really great story that illustrates the calling of apostles by the president of the church. Let's read some more from Elder Boyd K. Packer. He said in a conference talk, Then as now the world did not believe. They say that ordinary men are not inspired, that there are no prophets, no apostles, that angels do not minister unto men, not to ordinary men, that doubt and disbelief have not changed. But now, as then, their disbelief cannot change the truth. We lay no claim to being apostles of the world, but of the Lord Jesus Christ. The test is not whether men will believe, but whether the Lord has called us, and of that there is no doubt. We do not talk of those sacred interviews that qualify the servants of the Lord to bear a special witness of him, 
for we have been commanded not to do so. Compared to the others who have been called, I am nowhere near their equal, save it be perhaps in the certainty of the witness we share. I feel compelled on this 150th anniversary of the church to certify to you that I know that the day of miracles has not ceased. I know that angels minister unto men. I am a witness to the truth that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, the only begotten of the Father, that he has a body of flesh and bone, that he knows those who are his servants here, and that he is known of them. This is a very, very powerful and specific apostolic testimony from Elder Packer. And there are many other such examples of these testimonies. So now let's consider the prophetic succession of President Russell M. Nelson. Here we have a fairly detailed account from Elder Gary E. Stevenson. He said, The most recent interregnum period began when President Monson passed away on January 2nd and ended 12 days later on Sunday, January 14th. On that Sabbath morning, the Quorum of the Twelve met in the upper room of the Salt Lake Temple in a spirit of fasting and prayer, under the presiding direction of President Russell M. Nelson, the senior apostle and president of the Quorum of the Twelve. In this sacred and memorable meeting, following a well-established precedent in unity and unanimity, the brethren were seated by seniority in a semicircle of thirteen chairs and raised their hands first to sustain the organization of a first presidency, and then to sustain President Russell Marion Nelson as president of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. This sustaining was followed by the Quorum of the Twelve, gathering in a circle and placing hands upon the head of President Nelson to ordain and set him apart, with the next most senior apostle acting as voice. President Nelson then named his counselors. President Dallin Harris Oaks, President Henry Benyon Eyring, with President Oaks as the president of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, and President Melvin Russell Ballard as the acting president of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. Following similar sustaining votes, each of these brethren was set apart to his respective office by President Nelson. This was a deeply sacred experience with an outpouring of the Spirit. I offer to you my absolute witness that the will of the Lord for which we fervently prayed, was powerfully manifest in the activities and events of that day. Now let's consider a common objection. Some people object to our claim by saying other people claim to be prophets and apostles too. And yes, we know this. We have been told in Scripture, in the Gospel of Mark, there will arise false Christs and false prophets, and they will perform signs and miracles in order to lead the elect astray if they are able. In the Gospel of Matthew, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are hungry wolves. How do we discern between true and false prophets? Let's talk through that. False prophets flatter. This is something that is articulated very, very well by Samuel the Lamanite in the Book of Mormon. He says, As the Lord liveth, if a prophet come among you and declareth unto you the word of the Lord, which testifieth of your sins and iniquities, Ye are angry with him, and cast him out, and seek all manner of ways to destroy him. Yea, you will say that he is a false prophet, and that he is a sinner, and of the devil, because he testifieth that your deeds are evil. But behold, if a man shall come among you, and shall say, Do this, and there is no iniquity, do that, and ye shall not suffer. Yea, he will say, Walk after the pride of your own hearts. Yea, walk after the pride of your eyes, and do whatsoever your heart desireth. And if a man shall come among you and say this, ye will receive him and say that he is a prophet. Yea, ye will lift him up, and ye will give unto him of your substance. Ye will give unto him of your gold and of your silver, and ye will clothe him with costly apparel. And because he speaketh flattering words unto you, and he saith that all is well, then ye will not find fault with him. Here Samuel is illustrating a human tendency to want to be validated, to want to be told that we are good, to want to be told that everything that we are doing is right. And false prophets are people who capitalize on this. Let's look at that in a little more detail. So in my presentation on the term cult as applied to Latter-day Saints, I talked about this spectrum of external and internal authority. What do we mean by that? 
when our spiritual authority is at an extreme of external authority, we're always looking for sources external to ourselves for our spiritual well being. We live on borrowed light and we make idols out of people and even sacred texts. We never actually develop our own spiritual muscles. We trust everything to outside sources. At the other extreme, we have the extreme of internal authority, which really becomes self-worship and relativism. And that's where we never trust any sources other than our own feelings, our own perceptions of things. We never defer to scripture or any other kinds of authority that are external to ourselves. So with the extreme of external authority, we hear people saying things like, trust my academic credentials over revelation, or follow this political savior, or I alone hold the one and only correct interpretation of scripture. At the extreme of internal authority, whatever you want, God wants you to have. Live your truth. Everything you think and feel is valid. And there is never any need to trust any authority outside of yourself. False prophets are going to exploit these human tendencies. Now, remembering my presentation on epistemology, I showed that the way we arrive at what we believe is almost like a council of sources of truth. And as we evaluate this question, is the president of the church a prophet? I've assembled a council of sources, and I believe that by far the strongest source as we evaluate this question is witness testimony. Witness testimony of prophetic gifts among presidents of the church, witness testimony of prophecy and inspiration, and witness testimony of God validating the prophetic mantle in the church. There are some other sources that can be useful, like personal revelation, and experience, and even beauty. Some people see the prophetic office validated by beautiful things that happen when we follow the prophet. And so I decided to keep that as an epistemic source here in the council. But let's examine these things, this witness testimony of prophetic gifts and inspiration and so forth. And let's start with our prophet Joseph F. Smith. Did he ever experience prophetic gifts and inspiration? I want to offer this case study. And in this example, we have a letter from one of his relatives to his son. And this relative, his name was Joseph Bailey Smith, and he's writing to his son, Joseph Byron Smith. And he appears to be trying to strengthen the faith of Joseph Byron Smith by bringing something to his remembrance. And it was an encounter that they had with Joseph F. Smith. Here is what Joseph Bailey Smith says. And I'm going to paraphrase because he doesn't seem to have been the best communicator. So I'm going to try to paraphrase to make his statement here a little more understandable. He says, you were blessed by Joseph F. Smith, prophet of the church. And when you and I were in his office, you were part of a revelation given when I spoke that it was too bad that the Abraham papyri were burnt in the Chicago fire. Joseph F. Smith put his hands to his face and said, Brother Joseph, they are not gone. And before your son is 63 years old, they will be in the hands of the church. You will live to see this and you will know the truth. Okay. There's a very, very specific prophecy from Joseph F. Smith to a couple of people who were in his office one of whom expressed some sadness that the book of Abraham papyri were not in possession of the church. And he was given a very, very specific prophecy. Before your son is 63 years old, those will come back to the church. And this did happen. On November 27th, 1967, the papyri came back to the church and Joseph Byron was 61 at the time. It's a very, very specific prophecy that was fulfilled. Another example is section 138 of our current Doctrine and Covenants. And Joseph F. Smith said in General Conference of the Church in October 12th, 1918, I have dwelt in the spirit of prayer, of supplication, of faith, and of determination, and I have had my communications with the Spirit of the Lord continuously. And then he put forward to the church what we have now as the vision of the redemption of the dead. 
And you can see some very, very specific, descriptive, visionary language of things that he saw and experienced in that vision. It's a very, very powerful example of prophetic gifts alive and well in the church in the time of Joseph F. Smith. Let's talk about another example that's a little more recent. Let's talk about the example of Spencer W. Kimball and his revelation that offered the priesthood to all worthy males throughout the church, reversing the exclusion of those with African ancestry. In one of his biographies, we are told that President Kimball spoke to the Quorum of the Twelve, and he said, Brethren, I have canceled lunch for today. Would you be willing to remain in the temple with us? I would like you to continue to fast with me. I have been going to the temple almost daily for many weeks now, sometimes for hours entreating the Lord for a clear answer. I have not been determined in advance what the answer should be. And I will be satisfied with a simple yes or no, but I want to know. Whatever the Lord's decision is, I will defend it to the limits of my strength, even to death. He then outlined the direction his thoughts had carried him, the fading of his reluctance, the disappearance of objections, the growing assurance he had received, the tentative decision he had reached, and his desire for a clear answer. Once more, he asked the Twelve to speak freely and without concern for seniority. Elder McConkie spoke in favor of the change, noting there was no scriptural impediment. President Tanner asked searching questions as Elder McConkie spoke. Elder Packer also favored the change, speaking at length, quoting scriptures in support. Eight of the ten volunteered their views, all favorable. President Kimball called on the other two, and they also spoke in favor. Discussion continued for two hours. They then sought divine confirmation. President Kimball asked, Do you mind if I lead you in prayer? He had reached a decision after great struggle, and he desperately wanted the Lord's confirmation if it would come. They surrounded the altar in a prayer circle. President Kimball spoke to the Lord at length. If extending the priesthood was not right, if the Lord did not want this change to come in the church, he said he would fight the world's opposition. Elder McConkie later recounted, The Lord took over, and President Kimball was inspired in his prayer, asking the right questions, and he asked for a manifestation confirming the decision. During that insistent prayer, those present felt something powerful, unifying, ineffable. Those who tried to describe it later struggled to find words. Elder McConkie said, It was as though another day of Pentecost came. On the day of Pentecost in the old world, it is recorded that cloven tongues of fire rested upon the people. They were trying to put into words what is impossible to express directly. There are no words to describe the sensation. But simultaneously, the twelve and the three members of the First Presidency had the Holy Ghost descend upon them, and they knew that God had manifested His will. I had had some remarkable spiritual experiences before particularly in connection with my call as an apostle, but nothing of this magnitude. All of the brethren at once knew and felt in their souls what the answer to the importuning petition of President Kimball was. Some of the brethren were weeping. All were sober and somewhat overcome. When President Kimball stood up, several of the brethren in turn threw their arms around him. This is another very, very powerful account of God revealing his will to the prophet. Let's look at another example, even more recent. And this is an example from a conference talk by Elder Dean Davies, where he talks about President Hinckley selecting the location for the Vancouver Temple. Let's listen in. After spending time on the site, I asked President Hinckley if he would like to see some of the other sites that had been considered. He said, yes, he would like that. You see, by looking at the other sites, we were able to make a comparison of their virtues. We did a large clockwise loop around Vancouver, looking at the other properties, ultimately arriving back at the original site. President Hinckley said, this is a beautiful site. Then he asked, can we go to the church-owned meeting house about one quarter mile away? Of course, President, we responded. We got back into the cars and drove to the nearby meeting house. 
As we arrived at the chapel, President Hinckley said, Turn left here. We turned and followed the street as instructed. The street began to rise slightly. Just as the car reached the crown of the rise, President Hinckley said, Stop the car. Stop the car. He then pointed to the right at a parcel of ground and said, What about this property? This is where the temple goes. This is where the Lord wants the temple. Can you get it? Can you get it? We hadn't looked at this property. It was farther back and away from the main road, and it was not listed for sale. When we responded we didn't know, President Hinckley pointed to the property and said again, this is where the temple goes. We stayed a few minutes, then left for the airport to return home. The next day, Brother Williams and I were called to President Hinckley's office. He had drawn out everything on a piece of paper. The roads, the chapel, turn left here, X marks the spot for the temple. <laughs> he asked what we had found out. We told him he couldn't have picked a more difficult property. It was owned by three individuals, one from Canada, one from India, and one from China. And it didn't have the necessary religious zoning. Well, do your best, he said. <laughs> then the miracles happened. Within several months, we owned the property, and later the city of Langley, British Columbia, gave permission to build the temple. That's another very specific, powerful example of witness testimony of God revealing his will to the prophet. And now let's talk about President Russell M. Nelson. And here are some questions we can ask about him. Is he spiritually in tune with God's influence? Is he receiving revelation? And then going back to our questions about false prophets, is he power hungry or authoritarian at that extreme of external authority? Or is he flattering us like the extreme of internal authority? Or is he telling us hard things? And how do people respond to him? And what are the results? Let's first look at some witness testimony from Sister Wendy Nelson. Sometimes the Lord has me stay close to my husband when he is receiving instructions. Uh, my husband will say during the night, okay, dear, it's happening. I just remain quiet. And then soon he's sitting up at the side of the bed writing, now with a lighted pen that someone gave him. It's pretty cute. The number of nighttime messages to him since becoming president of the church have increased exponentially. It's incredible. It was an early Saturday morning and I could feel I was supposed to get out of bed. I wasn't finished sleeping. I didn't want to get out of bed, but I could feel move out of bed now. So I went down and did some family history research. Two hours later, my husband emerged from our bedroom and said, Wendy, you won't believe what's been happening for two hours. The Lord has given me detailed instruction about a process I am to follow. And now let's see another example that answers this question of whether he's receiving revelation. The Lord has asked me to let you know tonight that we have a solemn duty to prepare our people for the difficult days that lie ahead. Please protect your families from the deception that you will see in the future. And now let's look at a very simple example of ordinary inspiration that takes place in his role as prophet. Sister Wendy Nelson, in an interview, was talking about something that she noticed happen around the time of the COVID-19 pandemic. She said, so let's just refine that to say, since this last year was no travel, we're really talking about 35 countries and 14 states in two years. That's what we're talking about. And let me just say one other thing about this year of no travel. Imagine this. Exactly a year ago, December 2019, I looked at our 2020 calendar to see where we would be going, where we would be traveling, and looked from January through July every single month. There was a huge trip and arenas, huge arenas booked. And I thought, okay, well, this is what we'll do. 
And I knew that in between those, there was at least one huge trip a month that in between we would be doing local opportunities to be with our local congregations. There I am. I've sort of got my whole head set into this is how it's going to be in 2020. And suddenly, in early January, I looked on the calendar again, and everything's gone, meaning all those trips were gone. So this is early January. This is pre-COVID. And I said, I said, where did those trips go? And he said, I just felt like we didn't need to do them. I just felt like I should take those off the calendar. This is a wonderful example that speaks to the question of whether he's in tune with God's spirit. There are situations where he just acts on inspiration without really knowing why. And this is a pretty remarkable example of that. And now let's move on to this question of whether he's a power-hungry authoritarian personality. Let's listen to Elder Quentin L. Cook describing the revelatory process with President Nelson in a conference talk. When important changes to bless our homes were announced at the October 2018 General Conference, I testified that in the deliberations of the Council of the First Presidency and the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles in the Temple, after our beloved prophet petitioned the Lord for revelation, a powerful confirmation was received by all. At that time, other revelations relating to sacred temple ordinances had been received but not announced or implemented. This guidance commenced with individual prophetic revelation to President Russell M. Nelson and tender and powerful confirmation to those participating in the process. President Nelson specifically involved the sisters who preside over the Relief Society, the young women and primary organizations, the final guidance in the temple to the First Presidency and Quorum of the Twelve Apostles was profoundly spiritual and powerful. We each knew we had received the mind, will, and voice of the Lord. I declare with all solemnity that continuous revelation has been received and is being received through channels the Lord has established. That's an amazing account. Look how he involved other people, especially how he involved the sisters who preside over the Relief Society, young women, and primary organizations. I need to reiterate something that I've said in other contexts. When we use the phrase, follow the prophet, sometimes we're talking specifically about the president of the church. But more often, we're talking about a group of councils that govern the church. And this group of councils includes women. So when we talk about the institutional prophetic office of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, it is a group of people. It's not just one individual. That is something that's really important for us to understand. And let's continue here. Once again, is President Nelson a power-hungry authoritarian? Here in this Facebook post, we get a glimpse of the heart of President Nelson, and he's a man with no ego. It's a wonderful example of how the prophet also sets the tone for the church in terms of modeling a happy way to live and happy ways to be in our relationships. And now let's move on to this question. Is President Nelson flattering us like false prophets do, or is he challenging us? Let's look at some examples of things he has been telling us. Brethren, your first and foremost duty as a bearer of the priesthood is to love and care for your wife. Become one with her. Be her partner. Make it easy for her to want to be yours. No other interest in life should take priority over building an eternal relationship with her. Nothing on TV, a mobile device or a computer, is more important than her well-being. Take an inventory of how you spend your time and where you devote your energy. That will tell you where your heart is. Pray to have your heart attuned to your wife's heart. Seek to bring her joy. Seek her counsel and listen. Her input will improve your output. (laughs) 
If you have a need to repent because of the way you have treated the women closest to you, begin now. Brethren, we all need to repent. We need to get up off the couch, put down the remote, and wake up from our spiritual slumber. You may know for yourself what is true and what is not by learning to discern the whisperings of the Spirit. Ask your Heavenly Father if we truly are the Lord's apostles and prophets. Ask if we have received revelation on this and other matters. Ask if these five truths are, in fact, true. Now, as president of his church, I plead with you who have dis distanced yourselves from the church and with you who have not yet really sought to know that the Savior's church has been restored, do the spiritual work to find out for yourselves. And please do it now. Time is running out. In like manner, it is now time that we each implement extraordinary measures, perhaps measures we have never taken before, to strengthen our personal, spiritual foundations. Unprecedented times call for unprecedented measures. My dear brothers and sisters, these are the latter days. If you and I are to withstand the forthcoming perils and pressures, it is imperative that we each have a firm spiritual foundation built upon the rock of our Redeemer, Jesus Christ. So I ask each of you, how firm is your foundation? And what reinforcements to your testimony and understanding of the gospel are needed. The temple lies at the center of strengthening our faith and spiritual fortitude because the Savior and his doctrine are the very heart of the temple. Everything taught in the temple through instruction and through the Spirit increases our understanding of Jesus Christ. His essential ordinances bind us to him through sacred priesthood covenants. Then as we keep our covenants, he endows us with his healing, strengthening power. And oh, how we will need his power in the days ahead. And now let's ask the question, how do people respond to President Nelson? Because often that can give us some clues as to whether somebody is an authentic prophet. The scriptures describe people's responses to true and false prophets. True prophets are met with accusation, anger, and threats. In scriptural language, it's weeping, wailing, and gnashing of teeth. And this is an opportunity to observe. Are critics speaking from a place of psychological and emotional wholeness? Do they engage in cognitive distortions? Do they employ poor critical thinking skills? And do skeptics operate with sound assumptions and epistemology? And by contrast, what do we observe of people who follow President Nelson's guidance? What can we observe of their quality of life? What fruits are observable in their spiritual lives? And are they more or less capable of forming strong and supportive communities, what we call Zion, right? These are things that we can observe. These are very strong indicators of the authenticity of the prophetic mantle in the church. Sometimes in the church, we have our favorite apostles, people who we're eager to see in general conference, eager to hear from, because they teach in a certain way, or they just have a certain style or something or other that appeals to us. And then we sometimes have apostles who we kind of skip over in terms of paying attention. And the honest reality is that during his time as an apostle, President Nelson was an apostle who I generally kind of skipped over in general conference. 
I didn't pay nearly as much attention to him as, as I did to other apostles. So it was kind of interesting when he became president of the church, my honest impression was that he would be kind of a placeholder in that role. I didn't expect him to be much of an innovator in terms of how he carried out the prophetic office. And I'll also say that I have lived through several transitions of presidents of the church. And I've heard from other church members over the years who have described receiving a witness that this person who now occupies the prophetic office is indeed God's prophet. Again, I've seen several prophetic successions, never had that kind of an experience. But with President Nelson, it was different. When he gave some of his initial first talks as president of the church, I personally felt and sensed something very, very different about him. And it surprised me in a way that I had never experienced before. And I'll give an example of that. One of his initial statements to the church in general conference is one that I go back to a lot because I can sense the prophetic power of this statement. Let's listen to it here. I am optimistic about the future. It will be filled with opportunities for each of us to progress, contribute, and take the gospel to every corner of the earth. But I am also not naive about the days ahead. We live in a world that is complex and increasingly contentious. The constant availability of social media and a 24-hour news cycle bombard us with relentless messages. If we are to have any hope of sifting through the myriad of voices and the philosophies of men that attack truth, we must learn to receive revelation. Our Savior and Redeemer Jesus Christ will perform some of his mightiest works between now and when he comes again. We will see miraculous indications that God the Father and his Son Jesus Christ preside over this church in majesty and glory. But in coming days it will not be possible to survive spiritually without the guiding, directing, comforting, and constant influence of the Holy Ghost. This was a very, very powerful statement from President Nelson, and it has been echoed at several points during his ministry. It's something that we really need to take seriously, and it has impacted me greatly, more than most prophetic statements in recent years. And as I close this presentation, I want to offer my encouragement to take seriously the words of Christ regarding his servants. In the Gospel of Luke, the Savior said to his apostles, Whoever listens to you listens to me, and whoever rejects you rejects me, and whoever rejects me rejects him who sent me. In his visit to Book of Mormon peoples in 3rd Nephi, he said, Blessed are ye if ye shall give heed unto the words of these twelve, whom I have chosen from among you to minister unto you and to be your servants. And if you are skeptical or hostile toward our claim to the prophetic mantle in the church, I would encourage you to examine your perspective. Is it really based in evidence or is it just based in your paradigm? Part of the process of living a fulfilled life is growing and developing mentally, intellectually, spiritually, and in other ways. And a big part of that development is learning to examine our own perspective our own paradigm, the reasons why we believe the things that we believe. I hope that this presentation has offered some very specific and concrete reasons for the convictions that I hold, that the prophetic mantle in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is fully legitimate, and it rests upon President Russell M. Nelson. Finally, here are a couple of other videos that I've done that are relevant to this discussion. And these might be helpful as well to inform our thinking on these kinds of questions. Thank you for joining me for this presentation. This has been an episode of Latter-day Presentations. 
We would like to remind viewers that our channel represents our own views and not necessarily any official positions of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. We hope this presentation has been informative. Our notes for this show are at Nauvoo Neighbor and the link can be found in the show description. Also in the show description, we have a link to provide feedback. If you would like to suggest a topic for discussion, or if you would like to contribute a presentation on a topic of interest to you, let us know. Thanks again for joining us.